Welcome back to Between Two Wings. I'm Jay Wiles. This is part two of our conversation with Dean Neely, a NASA pilot who flies the ER-2, a highly sophisticated plane that operates at high altitudes for scientific research purposes. I hope you enjoy. So when you're in flight, you know, you you mentioned dehydration is a, a concern. How do you drink water, eat food? How does all that happen? Yeah, so that's uh, everything's a challenge up mm-hmm. there. Uh, it, everything's 10 times more difficult. Um, first, we always say when you put the uh, the full pressure suit on, it takes 20 of your IQ points away. So you get a little <laughs> number immediately. Everything gets more difficult just you yeah. know, walking through life and everything and trying to solve problems. Uh, for drinking and eating, uh, what we do is we carry a few water bottles up with us that have real long plastic straws on them. And in the base of the of the helmet, there's a little hole in there with a bladder behind it to keep pressurized. And we can punch a straw through that and and work that into our mouth and drink water that way. Um, and that's the way we keep hydrated. Typically, I'll try to take a few sips about every 15 to 20 minutes, and it kind of just maintains a, a slightly dehydrated status on, on my body um, throughout the flight. Uh, to eat food, uh, in fact, I should have grabbed one of the uh, tube foods we use. So it looks like a nice. tube, tube of toothpaste. And uh, up in uh, Boston, uh, they have chefs that that make these things and they come in different uh, flavors. It's like baby food, oh. essentially. <laughs> but it'll be like crushed up peaches, fruits, something like that, nice. pears, sauce. Any so, favorites of them? Um, I do. I actually, I stick to the simple fruits, actually, which is really mm-hmm. like baby food. And it's enough to just keep a few calories in your body. Yeah, totally. Um, in recent years, in the past few decades, they've really expanded the... Uh, uh, the availability of different flavors and substances. Uh, people can go out and look at it on YouTube. There's some specials out there showing how these chefs experiment with these things. Wow, and that's cool. Get something that's got this the right texture and the right taste that'll be appealing to a human that's trying to ingest this stuff. Uh, but we've got chocolate pudding, apple pie. There's uh, sloppy joes. They've even got a pizza huh. flavored thing out there wow. now. Wow, that's uh, interesting. As an older guy, I don't I don't mess with a lot of that. I've gotten used to over the years of doing this, how my body reacts to uh, certain foods and everything. And I want to stay predictable over the entire time that I'm locked in this plastic bag with a fishbowl on my head. So <laughs> I, I I go with what what works. And yeah, uh, absolutely. Then the, the next challenge that uh, this discussion usually leads to is, OK, well, Now, if you get hydrated or you're filled with food, now how do you get rid of all that? And for solid waste, there's no provision at all up there. Uh, It becomes a a, a real disaster uh, to make it back to the ground in time. Um, For the liquids, we uh, we wear a device that we can actually uh, use that goes into a hose outside one leg of the spacesuit and into a container below our right foot. So uh, we are able to to relieve ourselves that way, and then keep hydrating. Man, there's so, so many things you got that you got to think of that just aren't part of yeah other types of flying. It it when we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, I uh, I flew the uh, the seven forty seven for NASA with the the big telescope out the back, Sophia, and it was such a relief, you know, the day after one of these ER two missions where mm-hmm. I had the privilege, even though I was flying all night. Um, it was nice to be able to stand up and go get a cup of coffee, climb down the stairs, use the restroom, things like that. You really learn to appreciate those luxuries that are taken away in a unique environment like this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when you're up at altitude, you know, I, I've seen a picture of a fourth flight being used in an ER2. Yes. How how do you interact with the iPad and what are you using fourth flight for? Yeah, we uh, we use it just actually the same way that uh, most people use for flight and things like that on on tablets and, uh, and mobile devices in any airplane from a Cessna 172 all the way up. Uh, we usually mount it uh, right uh, on the side of the canopy rail. Mm-hmm. So it's like an extra display added to your avionics. So same way anybody would use it, whether yeah, you absolutely. have a device strapped to your leg or mounted somewhere in the cockpit. Uh, it provides all the same extra situation awareness 
um, that it would in any aircraft. So we've got moving map capability. We've got the location of the aircraft, the flight plan loaded in there uh, so we can see where the desired track is. Uh, we can also check weather and things like that. Um, so it's a it's a great tool to have. Really provides a lot of extra situation awareness to the pilot. Uh, yeah. It's great for the from the mission planning aspect all the way up through the uh, the flight operations, and then we can even use it for debrief purposes as well. Absolutely. Is there a type of pen you can use since you're you know in this in this suit? I, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just curious how you even touch an iPad at, at yeah, altitude. Yeah, another great question because, yeah, with uh, with these uh, big gloves on, yeah, yeah they were designed way before uh, <laughs> uh, touch screens. So yeah, what we fair. have to do is we carry a stylus. So oh, yeah. in addition to having to carry a pencil or a pen to write with on uh, information that's, that's loaded on cardboard uh, to be able to, you know, hand write things for data and information, we yeah. use a stylus that we have to use to hit the uh, touch screen. So we do that on the iPad as well as some of our newer avionics we have installed in the aircraft. That's good. Nice. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, when you're at altitude, are you interacting with any instruments at all? I imagine you can't move much. So are these kind of automated and you're just kind of getting things to the right place and the instruments will work? Right. For, um, uh... You know, most aircraft, you've got a, an, an airplane checklist that mm -hmm. you use for uh, whether it's ground operations or in flight, depending on the phase of flight you're in. So we we have the same thing for the ER2. Uh, so we know when to turn certain switches on and off or mm -hmm. take actions uh, flying the aircraft. And then what we do with the science instruments, with that payload, uh, it's always unique and different every time we fly. And so what we do is we also have a separate checklist that tells us when we need to, to uh, turn certain science instruments on or off. Uh, we could have execution steps uh, that may turn on a transmitter, whether we have a, a radar, a LIDAR, things like that with lasers, uh, multispectrometers, depending on what instruments we have loaded, we'll need to turn these on and off at certain mm -hmm. points to start recording data. Um and then some of them, because of the high altitude cold environment we're in, they have extra heaters that we have built in around those instruments so that uh, we want to turn those on or off at certain times. So we have a panel down in front of our left knee in the on the uh, dashboard that um, yeah. we actually wire all the science instruments into the back. And then we have, they're just, they're just keypads. It's almost like a huge telephone. And we have to have like the decoder ring where, <laughs> we know that, okay, if I push this button on the first row and the second one over, that pertains to turning this laser on or something like that, or it turns this navigation computer on or off. And we do these at certain times. So we have to, it keeps us busy because we're running multiple checklists at the same time. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, up in the air, that's how we actually operate the all the payload instruments that are on board the aircraft. And then the scientists down on the ground uh, are able to actually see uh, what the instrument is doing. Is it on or off? Is it operating correctly? Is it recording data? Is it seeing what they want it to see? And so that's how that communication goes back and forth between the, the pilot through the mobile pilot over to the scientists. And then we can change things. Sometimes there'll be faults and in, in, in things like that. It's just like rebooting a computer. We'll have to do that as well. And sometimes in the cockpit, we don't necessarily notice uh, those issues. Or if we do see some kind of, uh, you know, a red light, a fault or something like that, we usually call down and, and confirm with the science teams, is this what you're seeing? This is the indication I have in the cockpit. Do you want me to do something about it? Things like that. That makes sense. What, um, just real quick, what are some of the types of experiments or types of research you guys are doing? Like what, I know lightning is one of the things uh, I think we talked about before we hit the record button. What are some of the others? Yes, the uh, the most recent uh, campaign we did down flying out of Tampa, Florida, uh, we wanted to get close to an area where we wanted to fly in the summer down near the equator, where uh, thunderstorms and lightning storms typically really uh, are robust. Yeah. So, um, that was uh, one uh, campaign we just did. That was a unique one. We hadn't done that before in, in several years. 
where we have a lot of new lightning detection and lightning mapping instruments on board and trying to discover and fine tune and improve how those uh, uh, instruments can be used uh, to better observe and predict uh, weather patterns uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, other things that we'll do, typically we're looking uh, from, again, from the atmosphere, uh, from the top down. Uh, all the way to the surface. So sometimes we'll be using instruments that are looking all the way down through masses of air, uh, whether it's clouds, moisture, uh, aerosols, uh, looking at uh, pollution movements, how they migrate from continent to continent. Oh, wow. Uh, we'll That's go cool. over, we've flown in Africa recently where we want to uh, climb up over the ocean and take a look at how these masses will migrate through the stratosphere. So we're, we're way up in the stratosphere where most airplanes aren't operating um, to, to look at how air masses, either they move up, down, you know, and laterally as well, what the effects are as, as things, whether it's pollution, moisture, uh, effects from thunderstorms when they're shooting particles up into the stratosphere, then what happens to them after that? Uh, so these are all the kind of things that we do, uh, studying with the ER2. That's really cool. So you've, you know, when you're on, when you're on a mission, you're coming back, uh, to land, what does landing look like? Yeah. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned the chase car, the other pilot, I imagine they have, they play a pretty big role in that. Yes, they do. And, uh, and that's the, the visual part that uh, a lot of people see when they hear about this and how that mobile pilot, uh, what his role is uh, getting the aircraft safely on the ground. So um, after a, a long mission, and typically we're flying between six to eight hours, and after that, your your body, all that, remember all the chemistry changes and everything that biologically with the nitrogen out of your body, and then you get a little dehydrated, you're fatigued. Um by the time you come down now, it takes about uh, 45 to 50 minutes typically to descend uh, down and then get back near the ground where you're ready for the landing. And so you have to really uh, stay focused and appreciate how your fatigue is. Like any any pilot would have that's flying like across the Pacific Ocean or something for many hours. Uh, yeah, you I can imagine. Really gotta make sure you're on your game and mm -hmm. ready to really stay focused when you've got to put this unstable aircraft on the ground. And so when it lands, it's very different than the takeoff phase. On the takeoff, it only needs about 400 feet to take off. And then we just go straight up because it's wow. so powered. On the landing phase, it turns into more of a glider type profile. So it's uh, it's fairly shallow. And one problem is the landing gear configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, we've only got bicycle landing gear on it oh, so they're cool, interesting. not tricycle landing like most airplanes would have so we have two pogo outrigger wheels they look like training wheels that we use to taxi on the ground to keep those wings up and then those fall out on takeoff so when you land oh, wow. it's like landing a motorcycle with a 104 foot wingspan <laughs> like carrying a tightrope walker pole you know to balance oh yourself. wow that's it. so and interesting so it's like coming off a jump in a motorcycle, you've mm -hmm. got to be perfectly straight and no no drift or crab. Otherwise, it's just going to cartwheel on you. Yeah. And so that takes a, a a lot of uh, a lot of rudder work and uh, really fighting the flight controls as you slow down into the landing uh, speeds and and lose that flight control authority. And that's where, with the limited visibility you have, having the chase car come in behind you with the other pilot kind of talking you down to let you know if you're uh, off to, you have a degree of crab or two that you need to straighten out, uh, or how exactly how high above the ground you are. To really land this thing, we have to stall it aerodynamically. So we need wow. to strip all the lift off the wings. Otherwise, it'll float like a glider back up mm. into the air in a stall and then you're back into the cartwheel maneuver yeah so we fly it down to about 18 inches above the ground uh on the main gear and then we try to just freeze the aircraft there um without dragging the wingtips on the ground and not letting the aircraft land too fast and until it completely stalls so it's a real violent maneuver in the cockpit uh it's got a boat controller in there and a single throttle. And then of course the rudders uh, are a big part of this in the end game. And so that gets real violent as you're trying to make sure that you have no deviations before the aircraft touches down. 
And then unlike most aircraft that would have a, uh, a, a tricycle type landing gear where the main main gear touches down, then you fly the nose down and then you're kind of like driving a car back to the, uh, the gate or wherever you're going into your parking spot. Yeah. With us, the second battle starts at that point. So now it's it's more like a glider um, where now you've landed, but you have to keep flying the wings as you start to lose flight control authority at the slower speeds. You also can't let the, the wings drag or anything and go out of control. So you've got to keep fighting that all the way you can, until you can slow down to uh, almost a walking pace and then let one of the wings drop down. We've got titanium skids under the wingtip, so it is designed to be able to drag one on the ground, mm -hmm. but only at slower speeds where you won't have uh, control issues and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes another whole battle that we have to deal with because it is truly a yeah. tail aircraft, but also with the bicycle landing gear, glider pilots would really understand what that feels like. It's, it's very similar. We have lift spoilers and a lot of the controls that a normal glider would use to try to get the thing controlled and then stopped at slow speeds. That's really cool. Well, Dean, this has been amazing. I'm so thankful you came on Between Two Wings today to tell us all about this. This is fascinating. Well, thanks for having me. It's really been great talking with you today. Yeah. Uh, it's it's an easy topic to talk about uh, at, at NASA. We love sharing all of these things that we do with the, the different type of uh, aircraft, whether it's flight research, airborne science, things like that. Some of the core NASA missions that Typically, the public doesn't necessarily think about when we're all focused on space. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Uh, there's a lot going down on down in the Earth's atmosphere that we we need this type of aircraft to still look at. Uh, even down at the surface, like we talked about, uh, we look at volcanoes, volcano fault lines, where we measure slight movements, um, uh, coral reef. Uh, health, you know, like around the Hawaiian Islands, we go over there and do that as well. So a lot of, lot of things with the Earth's atmosphere that we uh, still need to study. So Definitely. It's, it's a great uh, topic. Uh, love, love discussing it with anybody and uh, glad, uh, glad you had me here today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's important work and uh, thank you for doing it. And uh, everyone, thank you so much for watching this episode of Between Two Wings. We'll see you next time. Yeah.